Welcome, welcome, welcome. Hope you had a good uh, dinner in there tonight. We'd like to say uh, welcome tonight. Welcome everyone here. Friday night, the greatest place to be on a Friday night. That's Encounter, absolutely. So anyhow, tonight we just want to say uh, welcome to those online, welcome to those here in, in person. And uh, we just want to say we appreciate you being here. You know, Encounter's it's just such a great place to be. I mean, it's a place where hope can be found. It's just it's, it's phenomenal. We just want to give a big shout-out to Bill and Carolyn. They'll be back next week. They're having it really rough right now. They're sitting on a beach somewhere, so let's not clap for them. Come on now. <laughs> so, anyhow, I'm just kidding. But he'll be back next week, and uh, he'll be back next week, and he'll really be rolling. So, uh so, yeah, so anyhow, we appreciate everybody being here. Like I say, everybody online, everybody in person. Bill will be back next week. We just, we just want to say tonight, we want the Lord to just show up in a mighty way here. We want the Holy Spirit to be here. Yes. So, absolutely. So, let's pray real quick, and then we're going to get to worshiping. Father God, we want to say thank you. Thank you completely for everything you do, Lord. We want you to be here tonight. Holy Spirit, we want you to show up in a mighty way. We want you to shake the mountains. Lord, we want you to just make the earth tremble. Father God, we say that tonight is a holy night, and we are welcoming you in right now to say, Lord, you are welcome here. Our hearts are open, and we are going to sing our praises to the great and mighty one for what you have done for us. So right now, Lord, we say come in, and just you are welcome. In Jesus' name we pray. Everyone stand with us. Worship this evening. Let's tell him how much we love him. silent surely it was through since when has impossible ever stopped you Friday's disappointment Sunday's empty tomb since when has impossible ever stopped you this is the sound of your eyeballs Praise make a dead man walk again. Hope in the grave, I'm coming out. I'm gonna live, gonna live again. This is the sound of dry bones rattling. Pentecostal fire, stirring something.
let's give him praise tonight. means to us tonight. There I was on death row, guilty in the first degree. Son of God hanging on a hill, hell was my destiny. The crowd was shouting, crucify. Shame was killing me. It would take a miracle to wash me clean. Then I read the red letters, and the ground began to shake. The prison. in my mind that say I'm not enough Every single lie that tells me I will never measure up And 
I'm more than just the sum of every high and every low. Remind me once again just who I am because I need to know. thank you that one touch from you, one word from you, and that ground begins to shake. And Lord, just like that, our identity can be changed because we are who you say we are. For those who are in Christ are a new creation. Behold, the old is gone and the new has come. Amen? The old has gone, the new has come. Who's thankful they're a new creation tonight? Man, I know I am. I know where my destiny was. I know where I was going. But one word, one touch from the Lord, and that trajectory changed forever. Thank you, Lord, that you are the great recycler of our pain, our guilt, our shame, 
You take away our sin and you turn us into trophies of your grace. Now, Father, tonight I ask in Jesus' name that your word go forth, that it be sharper than that double-edged sword and it go down to the marrow of our bones tonight. And it will not return void. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Guide us and be with us the rest of this evening. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen. You may be seated. Well, as Van said, welcome to Encounter, the best place to be on a Friday night. He already mentioned that Bill is somewhere in sunny Florida, soaking up the rays. Yeah, like Vance said, we don't need to clap for him. No, he will be back next week. Um, He sends his love. Uh, Welcome to those online as well. I know we've already done that, but welcome. Uh, Really, the only announcement that Bill wanted me to mention tonight was that on, please be in prayer, because on May 30th, he's going to be starting his Encounter radio show, uh, which is so cool. Um, he, I don't know if it's like 11, 15, 11 to 11.15 or 11.15 to 11.30, but he's got a really prime spot on a WJMM 99.1, I believe it is. And he just really, we need to bathe him in prayer for that. What a great way, uh, not just to get the ministry of encounter out there, but to talk about the Lord and what he can do through the power of of his saving grace and mercy and love and his faithfulness and his goodness and everything that encounter encompasses. So those are the announcements for this evening. So again, welcome. Uh, I'm really excited to bring the word tonight. This, um, this message has been stewing in me for a while. Um, I was actually going through some things uh, this afternoon and I walked in and my wife was sitting at the table working and I was like, babe, I, I might need a hanky for this one because uh, I, I might just get a little busted up up here. I'm just putting that out there. There ain't nothing wrong with a grown man crying, okay? Um, because I just, it is, should be the desire of every believer's heart to walk closer with the Lord every single day. To be in an intimate relationship with him. I say many times in my prayers, Lord, I need you more today than I did yesterday, and I'm going to need you more tomorrow than I did today. Is there anybody out here who has ever heard the song Day by Day? Day by day, oh dear Lord, three things I pray. I'm not going to sing the rest of it probably made most famous by the musical Godspell. That's, that's what made it probably the most famous. But the words of this song are actually attributed to the Bishop, of, Bishop Richard of Chichester. He lived from 1197 to 1253. And it's said that this was actually one of his prayers. So when he penned the words... Day by day, oh dear Lord, three things I pray. See thee more clearly, love thee more dearly, follow thee more nearly. The simple cry of a believer's heart. And it should be the cry of our hearts. I know it's mine. I want to get closer to Jesus. I want an intimate relationship with my Lord Jesus Christ. Now, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and find Ruth and turn to chapter 3. Now, Ruth is a story. It's a love story. It's a true story. But there is a story behind the story. So a little, a little backstory to the story. Ruth... Um, is a Moabite. She's from Moab. She is a Gentile. She's outside of the commonwealth of Israel. 
she is with her mother-in-law, Naomi. Now, Naomi and her husband had two sons. They both married. They both died. One daughter-in-law has gone away, and Ruth, the other daughter-in-law, has clung to her mother-in-law and is traveling with her back to Israel because Naomi knows that there is a man by the name of Boaz there. And Boaz is a family redeemer or a kinsman redeemer to Ruth. Naomi knows that Boaz was a relative of Ruth's dead husband. Now, not to get into any great cultural context, but a kinsman redeemer or a family redeemer is a male relative who, according to various laws, had the privilege or responsibility to act on behalf of a relative who was in trouble or in danger or in need. And Ruth, being a widow, had the chance to have a very hard life. So Naomi is taking her to Boaz. And this whole scene takes place during the barley harvest. And Boaz is the owner of the barley fields. So Boaz is a, he's a picture of Christ. Boaz is actually from Bethlehem. So the woman from Moab marries the bachelor from Bethlehem and they end up living happily ever after. Sorry if I spoiled the, the book for you. But the story behind the story shows us a picture, an illustration of the church, which is us, and the Lord Jesus Christ. For the church is the bride of Christ. Now, the scene that we're going to look at in chapter 3 this is a scene, it's, it's a very close relationship, like I said, of Ruth, who would be us, the church, and Boaz, who pictures Jesus Christ. Now, we're actually going to start in verse 1. So chapter 3, verse 1, Ruth's mother-in-law, Naomi, said to her, my daughter, shouldn't I find rest for you, And I want you to remember that word, rest. It's going to show up at the end. So that you will be taken care of. Now, isn't Boaz our relative? So Naomi knew this. And haven't you been working with his female servants? So at this point, Ruth had actually already met Boaz. She has been gleaning barley in his fields. Naomi says to her, this evening, he will be winnowing barley on the threshing floor. To winnow barley means you toss the barley up in the air and the chaff, which is the outer shell, the light part, the unusable part, it it blows off and the barley's heavy and it falls down to the floor. So he's going to be winnowing barley on the threshing floor. Now, this is Naomi's advice to Ruth, and it's the advice I'm going to give to you tonight on how to grow closer to Jesus, starting in verse 3. She says, wash, put on perfumed oil, and wear your best clothes. Go down to the threshing floor, but don't let the man know you are there until he has finished eating and drinking. When he lies down, notice the place where he's lying. Go in and uncover his feet and lie down. Then he will explain to you what you should do. So Ruth said to her, I will do everything you say. That's where we're going to start. So we're going to go through five ways, five pieces of advice that that Naomi gives to Ruth, and I'm going to give to you to draw closer to Jesus. Now, Christianity is not a code. It's not a cause, it's not a creed, it's not conduct, it's not a church, it's Christ. And the mark 
of every Christian is his or her love for the Lord Jesus Christ. And the true desire of every child of God is to know Jesus Christ intimately. We want more than redemption. We want a relationship. We want more than the gifts. We want the giver. We want and need Jesus Christ to be real to us. The Apostle Paul said, oh, that I may know him. Now, Paul knew him. Paul knew him intellectually. Paul knew him spiritually. But he wanted more. Now, you can know about somebody and not know somebody. You can know a lot about somebody and not know, truly know somebody. I don't merely want to know about Jesus. I want to know him. And when the Lord returns or he decides to take me home, I want to meet somebody face to face that I've known heart to heart. Now, here's the advice of Naomi. Number one, she says, wash. So point number one is to be freshly cleansed. Wash yourself, Ruth. Get cleaned up. You're going to go see Boaz. And this is what we need to do when we draw near to the Lord. James 4, 8 says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. That's usually where we stop. We like that part. But then it says, cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. James says, if you're going to draw near to God, you have to be clean. You can't worship with dirty hands, defiled hearts, and double minds. So the first step, and I believe it's the most important step, is for us to draw closer to Christ. We must be clean. The word says that if you hide iniquity or sin in your heart, he will not hear you. You talk about a prayer promise. I don't like that prayer promise. 2 Corinthians 7, 1 says, Since we have these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of the body and spirit, bringing holiness to completion in the fear of God. You know, many people will complain, Oh, the Lord doesn't hear me. My prayer life, it's dead. It's fruitless. In Isaiah 1, 15 through 16, says, when you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not listen. Now, why would the Lord do this? Why would God do that? It says, your hands are full of blood. Wash yourselves. Make yourselves clean. Remove the evil of your deeds before my eyes. Cease to do evil Learn to do good. You can't come near to God with dirty hands. Be clean before you come to me, he says. In the same book, Isaiah 52, 11, it says, depart, depart. Go out from there. Do no unclean thing. Go out from the midst of her. Purify yourselves, you who bear the vessels of the Lord. Now, can you imagine a bride going to her groom, wanting to be intimate, but she is dirty, grimy, smelly, and unclean? You see, so many of us say, Lord, I want an intimate relationship with you, but we don't come before him clean. We have un dealt with sin, iniquity in our lives. We must be daily cleansed. 
This is not last month's bath. This isn't last week's shower or yesterday's shower. This is a daily cleansing. So it begs to be asked, well, then how do I, how do I become cleansed? First way is by the word of God. Ephesians 5, 25 through 26 says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify her, here it is, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. By the washing of water with the word. The word of God is to your spirit what water is to your body. David says in Psalm 119, how can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to the word. So much of Psalm 119 is, Lord, I've kept your word. I've kept your precepts. I've kept your statutes. You know, James says the Bible is like a mirror. It shows us who we are. It reveals what is unclean in us. You see, not only do we read the Bible, but the Bible reads us. That might be why some people don't like reading the Bible. (laughs) Now, the good thing is that not only does the word reveal the sin, the unclean in us, It also gives us a solution to the sin. It's relationship with Jesus Christ. So we're cleansed by the word, but we're also cleansed by the blood. 1 John 1, 7 through 9 says, But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus his son cleanses us from all sin. Hallelujah. Naomi said to Ruth, wash, be clean. And we do that with the word and we're washed by the blood. You see, the word points out the sin, reminds us of the blood, and the word promises that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Now, you notice how in that verse it says, of our sins, not sin? There's a difference. So what's the difference? Oh, Lord, if I've sinned, forgive me. Oh, I know we're all sinners, so forgive me, Lord. That doesn't cut it. We need to say, Lord, I lost my temper. I had a lustful thought. I was unkind. I gossiped. I was lazy. I failed to do what I ought to have done. Last time I was up here giving the word, we talked about James 4. It says, those that know the good they ought to do and don't do it, it is a sin. It's a sin of omission. Has the Lord said, I need you to go do that. I need you to stop doing that, and you don't do it? That's a sin. We need to say, Lord, I did this. I did that. We need to name it, nail it, agree with God that it is wrong, and then he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. And ladies and gentlemen, when we are clean We are as clean as the east is from the west. The word says we are like newly driven snow. We are washed white. And what God calls clean, let no man call unclean. So point number one is be freshly cleansed. Wash yourself. Point number two Be fragrantly consecrated. She says, 
put on perfumed oil or anoint yourself. Naomi was smart. She knew what she was talking about. She said, Ruth, honey, you got to be clean and you got to smell good. (laughs) It's just true. Put on perfumed oil. Ruth, you got to smell sweet. Be nice to be near. Come with an aroma. You know, when my wife's getting ready in the morning, and she puts on her smell good, <laughs> and she comes out, and I give her a hug. Oh, that's nice to be near. You see, not only were brides anointed, but priests were also anointed. And the anointing of a priest It meant a consecration. They were set aside. They were set apart. As believers, we are set apart. We're meant to be different. We're meant to be consecrated. In Song of Solomon or Song of Songs, that's also a picture of Christ in the church, the bride and the bridegroom. Listen to what it says in chapter 4, verses 12 through 14. My sister, my bride, you are a locked garden, a locked garden and a sealed spring. Your branches are a paradise of pomegranates with choice fruits, henna with nard, nard and saffron, calamus and cinnamon, with all the trees of frankincense, myrrh and aloes, with all the best spices. They didn't have Macy's. Ladies, they didn't have Ulta where you could go and get your makeup and get your perfume. They had to go out into the field and they would collect spices and they would compound an anointing oil and they would wear it and the very fragrance would speak of love and intimacy. So if I'm washed by the word, and I'm cleansed by the blood, well, then what gives me an anointing? What gives me a sweet-smelling fragrance to the Lord Jesus Christ? Your anointing is the Holy Spirit. 1 John 2, 27 says, as for you, The anointing you received from him remains in you, and you don't need anyone to teach you. Instead, his anointing teaches you about all things, and it is true and is not a lie. Just as he taught you, remain in him. The anointing that we have is the Spirit of God. When you are clean, and you are filled with the Holy Spirit, and you come before the Lord, just like when I put my arms around my wife, the Lord goes, oh, I like that. The Holy Spirit, the word says, gives us the fragrance of Christ. Do you want an intimate relationship with Jesus? Do you want to be closer to the Lord? The Lord? Be anointed, be surrendered to the Holy Spirit so he can compound you into a sweet-smelling savor and that your very life will be like an incense to him. Do you ever meet someone like that? They walk so closely with the Lord. They have such an anointing that when they walk into the room, the atmosphere changes and it's almost like you can smell the incense. Now, I'm not talking about a physical smell. It's way beyond the physical. These are just the emblems of deeper spiritual truths in a person's life. I pray I walk that closely with the Holy Spirit, that I'm that surrendered to the Holy Spirit. We hear Bill say it all the time, You want to be surrendered to the Holy Spirit? You better be ready to run errands for him. Take marching orders from the Holy Spirit. Point number three. Be fitly clothed. 
She says, wash, put on perfumed oil, and look good. Put on your best clothes. I mean, Ruth, she is a prospective bride. Get dressed up, Ruth. Now, Ruth has been a widow. She's been wearing widow's garments, garments of mourning. And she's been out in the field gleaning and working. Her clothes are dusty and dirty. Naomi says, get rid of those clothes, Ruth. You're going to see Boaz. You know, I can only imagine that when a bride, not, not wed yet, says yes to the dress, how exciting that must be. How good that must feel. I think this was good news for Ruth. You know the gospel of good news is this. It's in Isaiah 61, verses 1 through 3. It says, The Spirit of the Lord God is on me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted. Ruth was brokenhearted to proclaim liberty to the captives and freedom to the prisoners. Ruth had been taken captive by sin, sorrow, and death to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of our God's vengeance to comfort all who mourn, to provide for those who mourn in Zion. This poor broken-hearted woman needed comfort to give them a crown of beauty for ashes Festive oil instead of mourning, and the garments of praise instead of despair. This is the way that Ruth is to dress up. Ruth, put off your ashes of sorrow. I'm going to give you beauty for ashes. Ruth, put away your mourning. I'm going to give you the oil of joy for mourning. Ruth, take off those garments of heaviness because I'm going to give you the garments of praise. How are we to come before the Lord? With beauty and with joy and with praise. So how do I get those kind of clothes? Read this with me. Isaiah 61.10. I delight greatly in the Lord. My soul rejoices in my God, for he has clothed me with garments of salvation and arrayed me in a robe of his righteousness as a bridegroom adorns his head like a priest and a bride adorns herself with jewels. You want Jesus to be more real to you? Pull some groans out of your prayers and shove in some hallelujahs. Come before his presence with singing and rejoicing and praise. Put on the garments of praise. You will find that if you put on the garments of praise, he will be more real to you than he has been with your old, stale stayed, take it or leave it prayers. Could you spend 15 minutes thanking him? Half an hour, an hour in gratitude, praise to your redeemer? Point number four, be fully committed. Continuing on in verse three, Going into four, go down to the threshing floor, but don't let the man know you are there until he has finished eating and drinking. When he lies down, notice the place where he's lying. Go in and uncover his feet and lie down. Then he will explain to you what you should do. So what does this mean? It means Ruth... You need to place yourself at the feet of your Redeemer. The most sacred place on earth is at the feet of Jesus. This was a sign of full commitment by Ruth. 
She goes to the threshing floor. She finds where Boaz is lying, pulls back the corner of his long garment, and there at his feet, she places herself. She is saying, Boaz, I am willing to take you as my redeemer husband. Now, folks, there is nothing dirty here. There is nothing indecent here. The threshing floor would have been a place where families were. This wasn't something done in some dark, secluded place. Down in verse 11, which we'll get to, Boaz actually says to her, I know you're a virtuous woman. Nothing dirty, nothing impure. She is placing herself at his feet under his protection. In verse 9, she says, take me under your wing. Other versions will say, take me under your skirt or your garment, but it's translated wings. Take me under your protection. I am fully committed to you. So I ask you, can you have an intimate relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ if you're not fully committed to him? The answer is no. So we need to ask ourselves daily, am I cleansed? Am I fragrantly consecrated? Am I fitly clothed? Am I coming to him with the garments of praise on? And have I fully committed myself to my redeemer, placing myself at his feet? Bill spoke on this. Mary had a habit of placing herself at the feet of Jesus. I want to make that a habit of mine. The most sacred place on earth, it's not a seat in this church. It's not even at this altar. It's not at this pulpit. It's not in a temple somewhere. It's at the feet of Jesus when you are fully committed to him. I laid myself at the feet of my Redeemer in my car on Clay's Mill Road. A lot of you all know the story. I wasn't at a church. I wasn't at a Bible study. I wasn't at an altar. Right in my car, I said, I surrender, and I place myself at your feet. I told you I was going to get busted up. He has become more real to me every single day of my life. And he can become more real to you if you surrender and place yourself at the feet of Jesus and at the foot of the cross. Fully committed to him. Point number five, be faithfully compliant. You not only have to be fully committed, but you have to be faithfully compliant. Verses five through eight. We're going a little further on now. So Naomi Naomi goes, uncovers his feet, lays down. Ruth says to her, I will do everything you say. So she went down to the threshing floor and did everything her mother-in-law had charged her to do. After Boaz ate, drank, and was in good spirits, he went to lie down at the end of a pile of barley. She came in secretly, uncovered his feet, and lay down. Okay? So Ruth was not only a hearer of the word, but Ruth was a doer of the word. How can we be near to Jesus if we're not willing to obey him? Can you take place at his feet without hearing his word? Naomi says, he will tell you what you should do. Ruth says, I will do it. We need to say, yes, Lord, whatever it is, yes to your will and yes to your way. John 7, 6, or 7, 16 through 17, Jesus said this, my teaching is not my own. It comes from the one who sent me. Anyone who chooses to do the will of God will find out whether my teaching comes from God or whether I speak on my own. 
So if you surrender your will to the Lord, God will teach you. You know, so many times I think we say, Lord, tell me what you want me to do, and then I'll tell you whether or not I want to do it. That's not the way it goes. One of the greatest verses in the Bible about knowing the Lord intimately is John 14, 21. Jesus says, whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love them and show myself to them. If you're fully compliant, the Lord says, I'll show myself to you. I'll make myself real to you. Now, I'm going to say something that some of you might disagree with at first, You don't know God by Bible study alone. You can walk into church, walk into seminary with this book under your arm and be a backslider. What good is it if you know Hebrew but you don't know him? What good is it if you know Greek but you don't know God? Bible study gives you knowledge about God. Obedience gives you knowledge of God. There's a difference. Boaz was near to Ruth because she said, I'll do what he says. I will be faithfully compliant to his will. So that's the five pieces of advice. Now, I want you to listen to Boaz's response to Ruth, starting in verse 8. So at midnight, Boaz was startled, turned over, and there lying at his feet was a woman. I might have been a little startled too. So he asked, "Uh, who are you? She said, I am Ruth, your servant, she replied. Here's that verse I was talking about. Take me under your wing, for you are a family redeemer. Verse 10. Then he said, may the Lord bless you, my daughter. He blessed her. Ephesians 1, 3 says, praise be to God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. He goes on to say in verse 11, he then says, don't be afraid, my daughter. I will do for you whatever you say, since all my people in town know that you are a woman of noble character. I know you're a virtuous woman. He reassured her. Now there actually was, I'm not going to go into it, there actually was another man in line before Boaz that could possibly be Ruth's redeemer. Boaz knew that, but he reassured her. He spoke peace to her. He said, don't be afraid. Ruth knew that Boaz cared and loved her. He actually loved Ruth first. He took the initiative. The Bible says that we love because he loved us first. And John 4, 18 says, and it's perfect love that casts out all fear. And you know what I'm so thankful for? It's not our ability to love perfectly. (laughs) We can never love perfectly. But Christ loves us perfectly. And that should reassure us and speak peace to us so that we have No fear. Then jump down to verse 15. 
And he told Ruth, bring the shawl you're wearing and hold, hold it out. When she held it out, he shoveled six measures of barley into her shawl and she went back into town. He replenishes her. He says, bring that shawl over here. And he shovels six measures of barley. One commentator said it probably weighed 60 pounds. She didn't need that much barley. Our Redeemer, our Lord Jesus Christ will go above and beyond and give us exceedingly more than we could ever imagine. He came to give us life and give it abundantly. He loads her down. He replenishes her because he loves her. And our heavenly redeemer loves us. Verses 16 through 17. Ruth goes back to Naomi. I love this. She went to her mother-in-law, mother-in-law Naomi, who asked her, what happened, my daughter? She wants to know, uh, are you going to be the new Mrs. Boaz? And Naomi says, mama, look, look at what Boaz has done. I said, Naomi gives five pieces of advice. She actually gives one more piece of advice. I told you to remember that word, rest. In verse 18, Naomi said, my daughter, wait until you find out how things go. For he, the man, won't rest unless he resolves this today. The man won't rest until he resolves it today. Naomi says, Ruth, you did your part. Now sit, be still, wait, be at rest. You know, the first time we see Jesus in the temple as a young boy, he's gone away from his parents, <laughs> they lose him, <laughs> and they find him in the temple, and they say, what are you doing here? And he says, don't you know? I must be about my father's work. John chapter 4, verse 34, Jesus says, my food is to, to do the will of of the one who sent me and to finish his work. Praise and worship team, you can come on up. I think about Jesus when he was being judged. It says he was silent like a sheep going to the shears. He didn't open his mouth, he could have, but he said, I can't rest because the work's not done yet. I think about when he was beat, beard being torn out. Tell us who hit you, Jesus. He could have told him, but he said, I can't rest. The work's not done. When they beat him with the cat of nine tails, it says, didn't even look like a human. He said, I can't rest. The work's not done. And then he nailed those precious hands and feet to that tree. And they said, come down from there. Praise God he didn't. He could have called down a host of angels, but he said, I can't rest because the work's not done. And it wasn't until he said, it is finished. And that veil was torn. That the work of the cross was completed. Jesus didn't rest until the work of the cross was done. And he did it for you and he did it for me. 
because he loved us enough to die. And because of that work on the cross, if we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, one day we will have eternal rest in heaven with our Father. But Jesus' work isn't done. He rose up out of that grave and he's still alive. And he's still working today because he can't rest because the work's not done yet. And our work is not done yet. He wants to work in your life. He wants to work in my life every single day. It doesn't finish until we're in heaven. I think it's Ruth Ruth Graham's... uh, tombstone says something to the effect of work finally completed. She's in heaven with her father. And you know what? As we go into this last song, maybe there's some of you who are in a group and you're in point number one. You say, I'm not clean before the Lord. Maybe you've never accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. You've never repented, confessed your sins to Jesus. With every head bowed and every eye closed, if you would be honest with yourself tonight and say, Ryan, I'm in that group number one. I'm not... I'm not cleansed. I'm not washed. I haven't been washed by the word, and I haven't been cleansed by his blood. Would you just slip up your hand? Just let me know. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You can put your hands down. Maybe there's some of you here who you would go, well, Ryan, yeah, I have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, but I don't feel like I've been fully committed I haven't been laying myself at the feet of my Redeemer every single day. I haven't really had as intimate of a relationship as I should have. Maybe some of you are in that group. We're going to open up this altar during the last song. If I have anybody from prayer team, you can come up and stand on the sides. If you were in that group, number one, I'm going to be standing down here. David will be standing down here. Would you come let us know? We'd like to pray with you. And if there's anybody else that just has business that they need to do with the Lord, maybe you have some unconfessed sin that you've been dealing with in your life. Now's the time to do it. I'm going to pray for us. But don't leave without doing business with the Lord tonight. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for the finished work of the cross. And Lord, that you didn't rest until the work was finished. And Lord, you paid the price for us with your blood for the forgiveness of our sins so that we could spend eternity with you in an eternal rest. The Holy Spirit, I pray that you move through the hearts of every individual here Woo us, convict us, draw us to Jesus and that we would walk out of here tonight knowing that we see more clearly, we walk more nearly, and we love more dearly our heavenly Redeemer, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's worship, do business with the Lord at the altar. Every burden will be lifted in
to the Lamb Honor and glory Worthy is He who overcame Buried in shame Risen in power He is alive The stone is rolled righteousness. Amen. Lord, fill us with your Holy Spirit that we would be a sweet fragrance. Our lives would be a sweet fragrance to you and that we would desire to know you more intimately every single day. That we would grow in the word not just know the word, but obey the word and make it the authority over our lives. And that we lay ourselves at the feet of our Redeemer, the most sacred place, at the feet of Jesus. Thank you for your word, Lord. And thank you, Lord, that you desire relationship with us the word says you're closer than a brother walk closely with everyone in this room I pray keep us safe as we travel home and again Lord I thank you that our lives are changed because we have been in your presence 
Thank you for your presence tonight, Holy Spirit. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. There's still some people doing business with the Lord. Slip out quietly. Pick up your kids. God bless.